Chapter 11 Lawrence the Train Wrecker Fate never played a stranger prank than when she transformed this shy young Oxford graduate from a studious archaeologist into the leader of a hundred thrilling raids, creator of kings, commander of an army, and world's champion train wrecker. One day Lawrence Collum was trekking along the Wadi Etham. Behind him rode a thousand Bedouins mounted on the fleetest racing camels ever brought down the Negev. The Bedouins were improvising strange war songs describing the deeds of the blond Sharif, whom General Stores had introduced to me as the uncrowned King of Arabia. Lawrence headed the column. He paid no attention to the song, lauding him as a modern Abu Bakir. We were discussing the possibility of ancient Hittite civilization, forming the connecting link between the civilizations of Babylon and Nineveh and ancient Crete. But his mind was on other things, and suddenly he broke off to remark, Do you know, one of the most glorious sights I've ever seen is a trainload of Turkish soldiers ascending skyward after the explosion of a tulip. Three days later, the column started off at night in the direction of the Pilgrim Railway. In support of Lawrence were two hundred Hawaitat. After two days hard riding across a country more barren than the mountains of the moon, and through valleys reminiscent of Death Valley, California, the raiding column reached a ridge of hills near the important Turkish railway center in garrison town of Man. At a signal from Lawrence, all dismounted, left the camels, walked up to the summit of the nearest hill, and from between sandstone cliffs looked down across the railway track. This was the same railway that had been built some years before to enable the Turkish government to keep a closer hand on Arabia through transport of troops. It also simplified the problem of transportation for pilgrims to Medina and Mecca. Medina was garrisoned by an army of over 20,000 Turks and was strongly fortified Lawrence and his Arabs could have severed this line completely at any time, but they chose a shrewder policy. Train load after train load of supplies and ammunition must be sent down to Medina over that railway. So whenever Lawrence and his followers ran out of food or ammunition, they had a quaint little habit of slipping over, blowing up a train or two, looting it, and disappearing into the blue with everything that had been so thoughtfully sent down from Constantinople. As a result of the experience he gained on these raids, Lawrence's knowledge of the handling of high explosives was as extensive as his knowledge of archaeology, and he took great pride in his unique ability as a devastator of railways. The Bedouins, on the other hand, were entirely ignorant of the use of dynamite, so Lawrence nearly always planted all of his own mines and took the Bedouins along merely for company and to help carry off the loot. He had blown up so many trains that he was as familiar with the Turkish system of transportation and patrols as were the Turks themselves. In fact, he had dynamited Turkish trains passing along the Hijaz Railway with such regularity that, in Damascus, seats in the rear carriage sold for five and six times their normal value. Invariably, there was a wild scramble for seats at the rear of a train because Lawrence nearly always touched off his tulips, as he playfully called his mines under the engine with the result that the only carriages damaged were those in front. There were two important reasons why Lawrence preferred not to instruct the Arabs in the use of high explosives. First of all, he was afraid that the Bedouins would keep on playfully blowing up trains even after the termination of the war. They looked upon it merely as an ideal form of sport, one that was both amusing and lucrative. Secondly, it was extremely dangerous to leave footmarks along the railway line and he preferred not to delegate tulip planting to men who might be careless. The column crouched behind great chunks of sandstone for eight hours until a number of patrols had passed by. Lawrence satisfied himself that they were going at intervals of two hours. At midday, while the Turks were having their siesta, Lawrence slipped down to the railway line and, walking a short distance on the sleepers in his bare feet, in order not to leave impressions on the ground which might be seen by the Turks, he picked out what he considered a proper spot for planting a charge. Whenever he merely wanted to derail the engine of a train, he would use only a pound of blasting gelatin. When he wanted to blow it up, he would use from forty to fifty pounds. On this occasion, in order that no one might be disappointed, he used slightly more than fifty pounds. 
It took him a little more than an hour to dig a hole between the sleepers, bury the explosive, and run a fine wire underneath the rail, over the embankment, and up the hillside. Laying a mine is rather a long and tedious task. Lawrence first took off a top layer of railway ballast, which he placed in a bag that he carried under his cloak for that purpose. He next took out enough earth and rock to fill two five-gallon petrol tins. This he carried off to a distance of some fifty yards from the track and scattered along so that it would not be noticed by the Turkish patrols. After filling the cavity with his fifty-pound tulip seat of dynamite, he put the surface layer of ballast back in place and leveled it off with his hand. As a last precaution, he took a camel's hair brush, swept the ground smooth, and then, in order not to leave a footprint, walked backward down the bank for twenty yards, and with the brush carefully removed all trace of his tracks. He buried the wire for a distance of two hundred yards up the side of the hill, and then calmly sat down under a bush, right out in the open, and waited as nonchalantly as though tending a flock of sheep. When the first trains came along, the guards stationed on top of the cars and in front of the engine, with their rifles loaded, saw nothing more extraordinary than a lone Bedouin sitting on the hillside with a shepherd's staff in his hand. Lawrence allowed the front wheels of the engine to pass over the mine, and then, as his column lay there half paralyzed behind the boulders, he sent the current into the gelatin. It exploded with a roar like the falling of a six-story building. An enormous black cloud of smoke and dust went up. With a clanking and clattering of iron, the engine rose from the track. It broke squarely in two. The boiler exploded, and chunks of iron and steel showered the country for a radius of three hundred yards. Numerous bits of boilerplate missed Lawrence by inches. Instead of provisions, this train carried some four hundred Turkish soldiers on their way to the relief of Medina. They swarmed out of the coaches and started in a menacing manner toward Lawrence. All this time the Bedouins, lining the tops of the hills, were popping at the Turks. Evidently one Turkish officer suspected that the lone Arab was the mysterious Englishman for whom rewards of up to fifty thousand pounds had been offered. He shouted something, and the men, instead of shooting, ran toward Lawrence with the evident intention of taking him prisoner. But before they had advanced six paces, Lawrence whipped out his long-barreled colt from the folds of his abba and used it so effectively that they turned and fled. He always carried a heavy American frontier model weapon. Although very few persons ever actually saw him, it was well known among the British officers that he spent many hours at target practice, with the result that he had made himself an expert shot. Many of the Turks dodged behind the embankment and began shooting through the carriage wheels, but Lawrence, in anticipation of this, had posted two Lewis machine guns just around a curve in the track, where they covered the opposite side of the railway embankment behind which the Turks had taken refuge. The gun crews opened fire, and before the Turks knew what had happened, their line was raked from end to end, and every man behind the embankment either killed or wounded. The rest of the Turks who had remained on the train fled panic-stricken in all directions. The Arabs, who were crouching behind the rocks, popping away with their rifles, charged down, tore open the carriages, and tossed out everything on board that was not nailed down. The loot consisted of sacks of Turkish silver coin and paper currency, and many beautiful draperies which the Turks had taken from the private houses of wealthy Arabs in Medina. The Bedouins piled all the loot along the embankment, and with shouts of glee commenced to dividing it among themselves, while Lawrence signed the duplicate waybills and playfully returned one copy to a wounded Turkish guard whom he intended to leave behind. They were just like children around a Christmas tree. Occasionally two men would want the same silk or money rug and begin fighting over it. When that happened, Lawrence would step between them and turn the rug over to some third man. Early in September, accompanied by two sheiks of the Agalat Beni Atiyah from Mudurara, Lawrence left Aqaba and trekked up to the multicolored sandstone cliff country, which the tribesmen called Rum. In less than a week, he had been joined by a force of 116 Toweha, Zuida, Darausha, Dumania, Togatka, Zelabani, and Hawetat. The appointed rendezvous was a small railway bridge near Kilo 587, south of Damascus. 
Here, Lawrence buried his usual bit of tulip seed between the rails, and stationed Stokes and Lewis guns at vantage points three hundred yards or so distant. The following afternoon, a Turk patrol spotted them. An hour later, a party of forty mounted Turks put out from the fort at Haratamar to attack the mine-laying party from the south. Another party of over a hundred set forth to outflank Lawrence from the north, but he decided to take a chance and hold his ground. A little later, a train with two engines and two boxcars moved slowly up from Haratamar, machine guns and rifles spitting lead from the roofs and from loopholes in the cars as the train advanced. As it passed, Lawrence touched his electric switch and exploded a mine directly under the second engine. The jar was sufficient to derail the first, demolish the boiler, as well as smash the cabin tender of the second, upend the first boxcar, and derail the second. While the Arabs swarmed around looting the wrecked train, Lawrence fired a box of gun cotton under the front engine, completing its destruction. The boxcars were full of valuable baggage, and the Arabs went wild with joy. In all, seventy Turks were killed, ninety taken prisoner, and an Austrian lieutenant and thirteen Austrian and German sergeants blown up. Every fourth or fifth man of the famous fighting Habitat tribe is a sheik. Naturally, the head sheik has but little power. Frequently, these men would accompany Lawrence on a raid. On one such expedition to the railway near Bereshitia, he had to adjudicate for them in twelve cases of assault with weapons, four camel thefts, one marriage settlement, fourteen feuds, a bewitchment, and two cases of evil eye. He settled the bewitchment affair by counter-bewitching the hapless defendant. The evil eye cases he cleverly adjusted by sending the culprits away. On still another occasion, during the first week of the following October, Lawrence was sitting out in the open near Kilo 500. His Bedouin followers were concealed behind him in the broom brush. Along came a heavy train with twelve coaches. The explosion following the turning on of the electric current shattered the firebox of the locomotive, burst many of the tubes, hurled the cylinders into the air, completely cleaned out the cab, including the engineer and fireman, warped the frame of the engine, bent the two rear driving wheels, and broke their axles. When Lawrence put in his official report on this raid, he humorously added a postscript to the effect that the locomotive was beyond repair. The tender and first coach were also demolished. Mazmi Bey, a general of the Turkish general staff who happened to be on board, fired two shots out of the window of his private car with his Mauser pistol, which then, evidently, jammed. Although it appeared advisable for him to take to the camels in the distant hills, Lawrence and his band swooped down the train, captured eight coaches, killed twenty Turks, and carried off seventy tons of foodstuffs without suffering any losses. His only European companion on some of his wildest train-blowing parties was a daring Australian machine gunner, Sergeant Yells by name. He was a glutton for excitement and a tiger in a fight. On one occasion, when out with a raiding party of Abu Tai, Yells accounted for between thirty and forty Turks with his Lewis gun. When the loot was divided among the Bedouins, Yells, in true Australian fashion, insisted on having his share. So Lawrence handed him a Persian carpet and a fancy Turkish cavalry sword. Sharif, Sali, and Abdullah also played an important part in the raids on the Hijar Railway and in the capture of great convoys of Turkish camels near Medina. In 1917, Lawrence and his associates, in cooperation with Faisal, Ali, Abdullah, and Zaid, blew up 25 Turkish trains, tore up 15,000 rails, and destroyed 57 bridges and culverts. During the 18 months that he led the Arabs, they dynamited 79 trains and bridges. It is a remarkable fact that he participated in only one such expedition that turned out unsatisfactorily. General Allenby, in one of his reports, said that Colonel Lawrence had made the train wrecking the national sport of Arabia. Later in the campaign, near Dura, the most important railway junction south of Damascus, Lawrence touched off one of his tulips under the driving wheels of a particularly long and heavily armed train. It turned out that Jamal Pasha, the commander-in-chief of the Turkish armies, was on board with nearly a thousand troops. Jamal hopped out of the saloon and, followed by all his staff, jumped into a ditch. Lawrence had less than sixty Bedouins with him, but all were members of his personal bodyguard and famous fighters. 
In spite of the overwhelming odds, the young Englishman and his Arabs fought a pitched battle in which 125 Turks were killed, and Lawrence lost a third of his own force. The remainder of the Turks finally rallied around their commander-in-chief, and Lawrence and his Arabs had to show their heels. At every station along the Hijab Pilgrim Railway were one or two bells, which the Turkish officials rang as a warning to passengers when the train was ready to start. Nearly all of them now decorate the homes of Lawrence friends. Along with them are a dozen or more Turkish mileposts. Once again, we'll repeat after the train. Along with them are a dozen or more Turkish mileposts and the number plates from half the engines which formerly hauled trains over the line from Damascus to Medina. Lawrence and his associates collected these in order to confirm their victories. While in Arabia, I often heard the half-jocular, half-serious remark that Lawrence would capture a Turkish post merely for the sake of adding another bell to his collection, and it was no uncommon thing to see Lawrence or one of his officers walking stealthily along the railway embankment between patrols, searching for the iron post marking Kilo 1000 south of Damascus. Once found, they would cut it off with a tulip bud, a stick of dynamite. When not engaged in a major movement against the Turks or in mobilizing the Bedouins, Lawrence usually spent his time blowing up trains and demolishing track. So famous did this young archaeologist become throughout the Near East as a dynamiter of bridges and drains that after the final defeat of the Turkish armies, when word reached Cairo that Lawrence would soon be passing through Egypt en route to Paris, General Watson, GOC of troops, jocularly announced that he was going to detail a special attachment to guard Khazar el Nil the Brooklyn Bridge of Egypt, which crosses the Nile from Cairo to the residential suburb of Gezera. It had been rumored that Lawrence was dissatisfied at having finished up the campaign, with the odd number of 79 mine-laying parties to his credit, so the story spread up and down along the route of the Milk and Honey Railway between Egypt and Palestine that he proposed to make it an even 80 and wind up his career as a dynamiter in an appropriate manner by planting a few farewell tulips under the Khazar el Nil, just outside the door of the British military headquarters. Chapter 12 Drinkers of the Milk of War While Lawrence was traveling from sheik to sheik and from sharif to sharif, urging them with the eloquence of all the desert dialects at his command to join in the campaign against the Turks, Squadrons of German aeroplanes were swarming down from Constantinople in a winged attempt to frighten the Arabian army with their strange devil birds. But the Arabs refused to be intimidated. Instead, they insisted that their resourceful British leaders should get them some fighting swallows, too. Not long after a particularly obnoxious German air raid over Aqaba, a royal courier galloped up to Lawrence's tent on his racing dromedary. Without even waiting for his mount to kneel, he slid off the camel's hump and delivered a scroll in which was inscribed the following. O oh, faithful one, the government hath aeroplanes as the locusts. By the grace of Allah, I implore thee to ask thy king to dispatch us a dozen or so. Hussein. The people of Arabia are exceedingly ornate in poetical in expressing themselves. They swear by the splendor of light and the silence of night, and love to talk in imagery as rich as the colors in their Turk Ottoman prayer rugs. An American typewriting concern startled some people by advertising that more people use the Arabic alphabet than use either Roman or Chinese characters. They are very proud of their language and call it the language of the angels. They believe it is spoken in heaven. It is one of the most difficult languages in the world to master. According to our way of thinking, the Arabs begin at the end of a sentence and write backward. They have 450 words meaning line, 822 words meaning camel, and 1037 words meaning sword. Their language is full of color. They call a hobo a son of the road and a jackal a son of howling. Arab dispatch writers penned their accounts in picturesque vein. The fighting was worth seeing, wrote Amir Abdullah to Colonel Lawrence. The armed locomotives were escaping with the coaches of the train like a serpent beaten on the head. 
inspired by a squadron of antiquated bombing and reconnaissance planes which Lawrence had brought down from Egypt. The Arabs won an important victory over the Turks in the desert just south of the Dead Sea. Thereupon the commander of the Arabian army sent this message to King George. To His Majesty, the King of England. Our victorious troops have captured one of the enemy's divisions near Tapila. The truth follows by post. Faisal. Another Arab chieftain, in writing an account of an engagement, said, I sallied forth with my people, drinkers of the milk of war. The enemy advanced to meet us, but Allah was not with them. During the war, the British government ran telephone and telegraph wires from Jeddah on the Red Sea to the King's Palace in the Forbidden City. The lines were strung by Mohammedans from Egypt, not by Christians. In spite of his abhorrence of all modern inventions, the king permitted the installation merely because he realized the urgent importance of being able to keep in touch with his allies. As he insisted on living in the Forbidden City, the telephone and telegraph were a military necessity. There are about twenty branch phones on this official telephone system. One day a British general telephoned to His Majesty from Jeddah to discuss some urgent military and political question with him. In the middle of the conversation, the king overheard other voices on the line and shouted angrily down the wire to the exchange, I command thee to cut off every telephone in the hijab for one hour. It is I, the king, who speaks. And so it came to pass that the entire Arabian telephone system was tied up by a royal command. If you ever happen to be in Arabia and want to telephone to King Hussein, Caliph of Islam and Commander of the Faithful, all you have to do is to ask Central to give you Mecca number one. Shortly after the capture of Jeddah, Lawrence, in company with Colonel C. E. Wilson, the Governor of Port Sudan, Mr. Ronald Storrs, and Amir Abdullah, for their amusement, made the Turkish band which they had captured a few days before play Deutschland, Deutschland überall, the hymn of hate and other German songs. The king happened to ring up in the middle of the concert. Hearing the medley of discord, he requested that the receiver be left down, and for half an hour he sat in his palace in Mecca, chuckling with glee while the band did its worst. The British aviators who came down to Arabia not only had to wear Arab headdress, but they had to fly at a considerable height to avoid being shot at by the Bedouins, who have an irresistible desire to shoot anything that is moving fast. They peppered an armored car on one occasion and then sent around profuse apologies. They admitted they knew it was a friendly machine, but said it was going so fast they simply could not resist the temptation to see if they could hit it. Colonel Lawrence and his associates introduced the first motor cars into Holy Arabia, and Amir Faisal used a one-ton truck as his royal limousine. I went with him on one of his journeys from Aqaba to the front line at Wahedit in the desert, north of the Turkish stronghold at Man on the Hijaz Railway. We camped for the day on the summit of a high hill amid the ruins of an old Turkish fortress. That noon, Faisal gave a dinner in our honor. We sat around on empty boxes instead of squatting on the ground Arab fashion, and a table was improvised for our special benefit. The others present were General Nuri Pasha, Malud Bey, and old Auda Abu Tai. Before the meal, they served us with cups of sweetened tea. Then, for dinner, a great plate of rice crowned with chunks of lamb and goat was placed in the center of the table. Besides this, there was another dish of rice mixed with pieces of meat, beans with tomato sauce, lentils and peas, pomegranates, dried dates and figs, and a sort of candy made from sesame seed and sugar, resembling raw asbestos, heaped the groaning banquet board. For dessert, we were to have had a tin of California pears. They had been sent down from Egypt as a gift for the emir. Old Auda Abu Tai had never seen such delicious-looking pears in his life, and the temptation to sample them so sorely tried his patience that he was unable to await the end of the meal. Disregarding the food before him and throwing formality to the winds, he attacked them at once and devoured all of them before the rest of us were through the first course. At the end of the meal, small cups of coffee flavored with cardamom, an Indian seed with a minty taste, were served to us, and a bowl of water was solemnly passed around in order that we might remove remnants of the gravy still lingering in our beards. Then the emir's Abyssinian slaves brought cigarettes, and we strolled out with our field glasses to watch the battle in progress a few miles distant in the hollow of the land around Mon. Both before and after lunch, scores of Arabs filed into the tent to kiss Faisal's hand. He 
he never allowed them to touch it with their lips, but pulled it away just before they had an opportunity to kiss it, to show them how reluctant he was to be treated with special deference. Both Faisal and Lawrence owed much of their authoritative leadership to the recognition of the traditional independence of the tribes. The gallant old brigands would roam freely all their lives over the vast stretches of Arabia, making little private wars of their own, were not to be commanded or conscripted. They had to be gently cajoled into the bigger war and made to feel the sense of their own importance. Chapter 13 Auda Abu Tayy, the Bedouin Robin Hood By the grace of Allah, I, Auda Abu Tayy, warn you to quit Arabia before the end of Ramadan. We Arabs want this country to ourselves, Unless this is done by the beard of the prophet, I declare you proscribed, outlawed, and fair game for anyone to kill. This was the official and personal declaration of war issued by Auda Abu Tayy, the Hawatat chieftain, the greatest popular hero of modern Arabian history, the most celebrated fighting man the desert has produced in four generations. The proclamation was addressed to the Sultan of Turkey, to Jamal Pasha, the Viceroy of Syria, Palestine, and Arabia, and to the Mutsarif of Kadak, who was the Ottoman governor of the important district on the edge of the desert near the southern end of the Dead Sea, where Auda lived. The Arabian Revolution appealed to the Bedouin Robin Hood largely because it furnished him with an ideal excuse to declare personal war against the Turkish government. When Auda heard that Sharif Hussein had started a revolt against the Turks, he and his fearless Hawatat followers jumped into their saddles, galloped across the desert sands to Faisal's headquarters, and swore in the Koran that they would make the Sharif's enemies their enemies. Then they all sat down to a banquet in honor of the occasion. Suddenly old Auda uttered a potent Muslim oath, and reminded himself and his friends that he was wearing a set of Turkish false teeth. Cursing the Turkish dentist who had made them, he dashed out of the tent and smashed them on a rock. For two months he was in agony, and could eat only milk and boiled rice. When Lawrence came down from Egypt, Auda's mouth was giving him so much trouble that he had to send to Cairo for a British dentist to make the old brigand a special set of allied teeth. His undying loyalty and friendship proved a most valuable asset to Hussein and the allies in the Arabian campaign. Besides, he offered his rich and rare experience in the kind of warfare suitable to his country. With the exception of Lawrence, he has been the greatest raider of modern Arabia. During the last seventeen years, he has killed seventy-five men in hand and combat, all of them Arabs, for he does not include Turks in his game book. I do not think that his claim is far wrong, for he has been wounded twenty-two times, and in his battles has seen all his tribesmen hurt and most of his relatives killed. His right arm is so stiff that he can't scratch himself and has to use a camel stick. Although the Hawatat territory is situated in inland near the Gulf of Aqaba, Auda has led expeditions 600 miles south to Mecca, north as far as Aleppo, and a thousand miles east to Baghdad and Basra. Occasionally the tables are turned on him. One year, while he was leading an expedition against Ibn Saud, the ruler of Central Arabia, the Druses, came down from Yebel Haran in the hills south of Damascus, and spirited away all his camels. Auda took his loss calmly and philosophically, but word of his misfortune reached the ears of his friend nur Shalan, Emir of Jauf, ruler of North Central Arabia. In accordance with one of the unwritten laws of the desert, nur Shalan immediately sent out a half of all of his possessions. Old Auda prides himself on being the quintessence of Arabian tradition, a hundred successful raids have taken him from his home near the Dead Sea to all parts of the Arabian world. His loot he dispenses in staggering hospitality. He talks long, loud, and abundantly in a voice like a mountain torrent. Although Auda has probably captured more loot on his raids than any other Bedouin chieftain, he is a comparatively poor man as the result of his lavish hospitality. The prophets of a hundred successful raids have provided entertainment for his friends. One of his few remaining evidences of transitory wealth is an enormous copper kettle around which twenty-five people can gather a meal. His hospitality is sometimes very inconvenient, except to guests in the last stages of starvation. 
One day, when he was helping me to a heaped portion of rice and mutton from the copper kettle, I was discussing the subject of camels with him, and mentioned the fact that we had none in my country except in the zoos. The old Bedouin couldn't understand this, and insisted on presenting me with twenty of his prized dromedaries to take back to America to start a camel industry. It required all Lawrence's persuasive eloquence to convince him that it was impossible for me to accept the regal gift on account of the difficulty of transporting his camels halfway around the world. In May 1918, the Turks sent a large number of camels down from Syria. They put them into an impromptu corral at Mon Railway Station. Out a heard of this, and at the head of a small party of twelve of his tribesmen, he dashed boldly into Mon. There were thousands of Turkish soldiers all around, but before they realized what had occurred, Howda had rounded up twenty-five of the camels and had driven them off at a twenty-five-mile-an-hour gallop. He was full of such pranks as this, and recounted his adventures afterward with great gusto. One of the most amazing bits of brigandage in Howda's long and lurid career was when he held up his intimate friend and prince. Faisal was on his way across the desert on an expedition and had four thousand pounds in gold coin. Unluckily, his route lay throughout his country, and somehow the latter got to know about the treasure, so he insisted that Faisal and Renu remain as his guests until they had given the old pirate three thousand out of the four thousand sovereigns. Howda, of course, did not use force. He merely intimated that he was entitled to the gold. Howda Abu Tai is a handsome old chieftain, a pure desert type. He is tall, straight, and powerful and although sixty years of age, as active and sinewy as a cougar. His lined and haggard face is pure Bedouin. He has a broad, low forehead, high, sharp, hooked nose, greenish-brown eyes inclined to slant outward, black-pointed beard, and mustache tinged with gray. The name Auda means father of flying, which recalls the day on which he made his first aeroplane flight. Instead of showing any fear, he urged the pilot, Captain Furness Williams, to take him higher and higher. The old hero is as hard-headed as he is hot-headed. He receives advice, criticism, or abuse with a smile as constant as it is charming, but nothing on earth would make him change his mind, or obey an order, or follow a course of which he disapproves. He is modest, simple as a child, honest kind-hearted and affectionate, and warmly loved even by those to whom he is most trying, his friends. His hobby is to concoct fantastic tales about himself, and to relate fictitious but humorously horrible stories concerning the private life of his hosts or guests. He takes wild delight in making his friends uncomfortable. One time he strolled into the tent of his cousin Mohammed, and roared out for the benefit of all present how villainously his kinsmen had behaved at Elway. He told how Mohammed had bought a beautiful necklace for one of his wives, but alas, Mohammed met a strange woman, a very beautiful strange woman in Elway, who was as fascinating as starlight, and succumbing to her charms, he presented her with the necklace. It was a wonderful necklace with gems that sparkled as the stars, with blues that recalled the seas and reds of desert sunsets. Most eloquently, Howda discoursed on the lady's charms. On the other side of the partition, the women of Mohammed's household heard of their lord and master's perfidy. Although the tale was mischievously fabricated, there was a great commotion in the household of Mohammed, and his life was made unbearable for several weeks. Auda's home is on a mud flat eighty miles east of Aqaba. During his association with Lawrence in the Arabian campaign, he picked up many interesting details of life in Europe. His eyes sparkled at tales of hotels and cabarets and palaces, and he was suddenly fired with the determination to abandon his tent for a house as splendid as any C.D. Lawrence had known in London. The first problem that confronted him was the question of labor. This was solved by raiding a Turkish garrison and taking fifty prisoners whom he put to work digging wells. After he had finished that job, he promised them their liberty if they would build him a beautiful house. They constructed one with forty rooms and four towers, but on account of the scarcity of timber in the desert, no one could figure out how to roof such an enormous building. 
Auda, keen as a steel trap, immediately worked out a plan. Summoning his warriors, he started out across the sands to the Pilgrim's Railway, overpowering the passing Turkish patrol, and carried off thirty telegraph poles, which now formed the framework of his desert palace. Even a forty-room palace is none too large for Auda, who has not been strictly abstemious in his nuptial aspirations. In fact, he is noted throughout Arabia for his reckless polygamy. Every Mohammedan is permitted to have four wives at one time, if he can support them. Old Auda has been married twenty-eight times, and is ambitious to raise that record to fifty before he dies. But in spite of his numerous marriages, he has only one son living. All the others have been killed in raids and feuds. Young Mohammed Abu Tayyi was eleven years old when I saw him, but so undersized that his father could pick him up by the scruff of the neck and swing him into the saddle on his camel with one hand. When the caravan was on the march at night, his father, afraid that Mohammed, when asleep, would fall off the camel, often picked him up and stuffed him into one of his own saddlebags where the boy would spend the night. The youngster fought beside his father and Colonel Lawrence for the whole Arabian campaign. Out of his enthusiasm in making the Turks his enemies to the nth power, pouring into the cause all hatred he had reserved for personal feuds, brought many of the tribes to Lawrence's personal standard. Lawrence once remarked that Auda had somewhat like Caesar in his ability to keep around him as free a country of faithful friends, and around that a great ring of enemies. Even the renowned Nuri Shalan, as well as many other powerful chiefs friendly to Auda, were in constant terror lest they should offend him. The Hawatat tribe was formerly under the control of Ibn Rashid and his tribe, which long roamed the North Arabian desert. Later, under the leadership of Ibn Jazi, the tribe broke up into discordant sections. The Abu Tayy subsection is the joint work of Auda, the fighting man, and Muhammad al Dalan, the thinker. Ibn Jazi mistreated a Sharari guest of Auda's, and the proud and hospitable chief was infuriated. In the fifteen year feud that followed, Anad, Auda's eldest son and the pride of his heart, was killed. This feud between the two sections of the Hawatat tribe was one of Faisal's greatest difficulties in the operations around Aqaba and Man. It drove Hamid al Arar, the Ibn Jazi leader of today, into the arms of the Turks, while Sahiman Abu Tayy and the rest of the sub tribe went to El Way to join Lawrence and Faisal. Out of made peace with his sworn enemies at the request of Faisal, and it was the hardest thing the old man ever had to do in his life. The death of Anad killed all his hopes and ambitions for the Abu Tayy and has made his life seem a bitter failure. But Faisal ruled that his followers were to have no more blood feuds, and no Arab enemies except the adherents of Ibn Rashid in North Arabia, who have carried on perpetual and bitter warfare with all the other tribes of the desert. Faisal's success in bearing the innumerable hatchets of the Hajjah is pregnant with promise. In all Arab minds, the Sharif now stands above tribes, men, sheiks, and tribal jealousies, a Sharif now exercises the prestige of peacemaker and independent authority. Chapter 14 Knights of the Black Tents After Auda, Mohammed al Dalan is the chief figure of the Abu Tayy. He is taller than his cousin and massively built, a square headed, thoughtful man of forty five, with a melancholy humor and a kind heart carefully concealed beneath it. He acts as master of ceremonies for the Abu Tayy, is out as right-hand man, and frequently appears as his spokesman. Muhammad is greedy, richer than Auda, deeper and more calculating. Allah has endowed him with the eloquence of an Arabian Demosthenes. His tribesmen address him as father of eloquence. In a tribal council, he can always be relied upon to persuade his audience to accept his views. He can wield a sword right lustily, too, and is a drinker of the milk of war, second only in prowess to the mighty Auda. Zal Yan Mudlog is Auda's nephew. He is twenty-five, something of a dandy, with polished teeth, carefully curled mustache, and a trimmed and pointed beard. He, too, is greedy and sharp-witted, but without Muhammad's mentality. Auda has been training him for years as chief scout to the tribe, so that he is a most daring and acceptable commander in Agazu. Nuri Shalan, Emir of Yauf, 
is not such a picturesque character as his friend and kinsman Nauda Abu Tayy, but as ruler of the Rala Hanazay tribe, 200,000 strong, the largest single tribe in the desert, occupying nearly all the territory between Damascus and Baghdad, he is one of the great men of Arabia. His friendship was most vital to Hussein and Lawrence in the taking of Dara and Damascus, and might have been of tremendous weight to Faisal now that he has been placed on the throne of Mesopotamia, had he not sold himself to the French in Syria in 1919 after the war. Lawrence would not let Nuri declare war on the Turks until the last minute, because Nuri's allegiance would have meant too many mouths to feed. Nuri Shalan was the deadly enemy of Ibn Rashid, who cooperated with the Turks, but who, since the Great War, has lost his portion of Arabia to Sultan Ibn Saud of Nejd. At one time, Nuri Shalan wanted an armorer. He captured Ibn Bani of Hali, Ibn Rashid's armor, the most skilled man of his craft in Arabia, and put him in prison with his own smith, Ibn Zari. He gave them both forges and tools and declared that they should languish in prison until Ibn Zari could make swords and daggers that could not be distinguished from those of Ibn Bani. They sweated and worked, and the forges were kept burning until late every night. And finally, after many weeks, Ibn Zari produced a wonderful dagger with an edge that could cut almost the wind. Nuri was satisfied. He released his two prisoners and sent Ibn Bani back to his country with rich presents. Nuri Shalon was an old man of seventy when the Arab Revolution broke out. He was always ambitious and determined to be a leader. Thirty years ago he killed his two brothers and made himself chief of the tribe. He ruled his people with a rod of iron, and they were practically the only Bedouins who obeyed orders. If they fail him, he has their heads cut off. But in spite of his cruelty, his followers all admire and are proud of him. Most Arab sheiks talk like magpies, but Nuri remains silent in the tribal council and settles everything with a few final clean-cut words of decision. Until the end of the war, he had preferred tent life to that of all the palaces from Baghdad to the Bosporus, and kept great state in the largest black goat's hair tent in the desert, where sheep were slaughtered every few minutes for the endless stream of guests. He owned the best weed land in Syria and the finest camels and horses. He is so rich, he does not know how to measure his wealth. Matlag ibn Jemian, sheik of the Beni Hatiyah, south of Ma'an, added 4,000 fighting men to King Hussein's forces. He is hard-working and brave as a lion. He helped Lawrence blow up trains near Ma'an and was in the thick of the fray whenever there were railway stations to be captured, or any other little jobs of a particularly dangerous nature. During the scouting around Ma'an, two of Lawrence's officers were trying to find an ancient Roman road in the desert. Matlag, always eager for adventure, went with them. In the deep sand, their ford careened madly from left to right, and then at one point swerved so sharply that Matlag was thrown on his head. The officers jumped out of the car and ran back to pick him up and apologized to him, thinking he would be very angry. But the old sheik brushed off the sand and said ruefully, Please don't be offended with me. I haven't learnt to ride one of these things yet. He regarded riding in a motor car as an art that had to be mastered just like riding a camel. The robber Harith clan may not have been in the good graces of Hussein before the war, but their Sharif, Ali ibn Hussein, a youth of nineteen, was responsible for converting nearly the whole of the Haran to the revolt. He was the most reckless, most impertinent, and jolliest fellow in the Arabian army. The fastest runner in the desert, he could catch up with a camel in his bare feet and swing into the saddle with one hand while holding his rifle with the other. When Ali went into battle, he took off all his clothing except his drawers. He said it was the cleanest way to get wounded. He had a wild sense of humor and made jokes about the king in his presence. He was one of the two sharifs in the Hijah who did not stand in terror of King Hussein. The other was Sharif Shakir, a cousin of Faisal and the richest man in the Hijah. He was the only big sharif who plaited his hair, and in addition he encouraged lice in it to show his respect for the old Bedouin proverb, a well-populated head is a sign of a generous mind. His home was in Mecca, but he spent most of his time in the saddle with the Bedouin tribesmen. There are a few of the leading chieftains, and some of whom enthusiasm for Arabian nationalism had to be kindled. 
others cajoled by appeals to their vanity, and almost all inflamed with the zest for war on a big scale, the game they had known and played at from childhood. When they had once sworn allegiance, they were as true as steel. Without their loyalty and dauntless courage and epic love of blood-curdling adventure, the Arabian campaign would have been a dream on paper fabricated by an impractical young archaeologist. In his dealings with Auda and other Arab chiefs, Lawrence found their rich sense of humor an important asset. Make an Arab laugh, and you can persuade him to do most things. Arabic is a solemn language, full of ceremony and stateliness, and Lawrence, who had an unusual knowledge of the various dialects spoken in Arabia, made the discovery that the direct translation to Arabic of ordinary colloquial English, spiced with wit, delighted his hearers. Another highly useful weapon in Colonel Lawrence's mental armory was the faculty of mastering the unexpected with some inspired improvisation. Time and again he happened upon a desperate situation from which there was no obvious means of escape. In the space of a few seconds, his alert brain would work out some seemingly fantastic but really brilliant method of dealing with the emergency. Such an incident was one of his many adventures in the Syrian desert. He was at the town of Azraq, among the shifting sand dunes southeast of Damascus, when a courier brought news that some Turkish spies were in a caravan of Syrian merchants, which was on its way to the Arabian army supply base at Aqaba, three hundred miles to the south. He immediately decided that in order to draw the teeth of the spies, he must reach Aqaba either in company with the caravan or soon after its arrival. Normally the journey from Azraq to Aqaba is twelve days by camel, and already the Syrian caravan had a start of nine days. Realizing that his followers could not stand the forced pace at which he meant to travel, Lawrence took with him but one man, a half-breed Harani, who was famous in the North Arabian desert for his endurance. The pair were racing over the ridges between Azraq and Bayir, eighty miles south of the camp from which they started, when suddenly a dozen Arabs appeared over the edge of a sand dune and galloped their camels down the slope to cut off the strangers. As they approached, the Arabs shouted a request that Lawrence and his companions should dismount, and at the same time announced themselves as friends and members of the Jazi Habitat tribe. When only thirty yards away, they themselves dismounted by way of encouraging the lone couple to do likewise. But Lawrence had recognized the Arabs as of the Beni Sakir allies of the Turks, and blood enemies of most of the Bedouin tribes that were fighting for King Hussein and Emir Faisal. It was known to the Beni Sakir that gold passed up and down the caravan route, and they were out looking for loot. This particular sector was the only wartime trade route between Syria and Arabia, along which the merchants of Syria had for many months journeyed to Aqaba for the purchase of Manchester cotton. Lawrence used cotton both as an aid to propaganda and as a means of getting as much gold as possible from Syria and Turkey. The Ottoman Empire needed cotton urgently, and for this reason the military authorities allowed traders to pass back and forth through the lines. When they reached Aqaba, Lawrence and the Arab leaders would make converts among them by preaching Arab nationalistic doctrines. At the same time, they would collect much valuable information regarding conditions in Turkey, the merchants were also useful in smuggling down to Aqaba German field glasses, which Lawrence needed for the equipment of his desert troops. Meanwhile, the dismounted marauders of the Bene Sakir stood on the sand and fingered their rifles expectantly, while still passing friendly greetings. Of a sudden, Lawrence grinned so genially that they became mystified. "'Come near. I want to whisper something to you,' he said to their leader." Then, bending down from the saddle of his camel, he asked, Do you know what your name is? The sheik looked speechless and rather amazed. Lawrence continued, I think it must be Terrace, which means procurer. This is the most terrible insult that one can offer a Bedouin. The Beni Sakir leader was dumbfounded and rather nervous. He could not understand how an ordinary traveler would dare to say such a thing to him in the open desert when numbers and arms were on his side. Before the sheik had time to recover himself, Lawrence remarked pleasantly, May Allah give you peace. Quietly telling the Harani to come along, he swung off across the sand. The men of Beni Sakir remained half bewildered until the pair had ridden about a hundred yards. Then they recovered their senses and began shooting, 
but the blonde prince of Mecca galloped over the nearest ridge and escaped. Bullets, by the way, have but little immediate effect on a camel that is traveling at twenty miles an hour. Both Lawrence and Isarani nearly killed their camels during the journey. They rode on an average of twenty-two hours a day. From dawn to setting sun, they crossed the burning sands, only stopping then for a moment's rest for their camels. When they reached out of Abu Tayyib's country, east of the southern end of the Dead Sea, they exchanged their mounts for fresh beasts. They covered the whole distance of 300 miles in just three days, a record for fast camel trekking that should stand for many years. This weird adventure was but one of a hundred that befell Lawrence. I heard of another which explains why he always carried a Colt revolver of an early frontier model. Some years ago, while wandering in Asia Minor near Mirage, a fever came upon him, and he made for Burgik, the nearest village. He happened to meet a Turkoman. They are a semi-nomadic crowd of Mongol descent, men with crooked eyes and faces that look as though they had been modeled in butter and then left out in the sun. He was not quite sure of his directions and asked the Turkoman to point out the way. The reply was, right across those low hills to the left. As Lawrence turned away from him, the Mongol sprang on his back, and they had a bit of a dogfight on the ground for a few minutes. But Lawrence had walked more than a thousand miles, and apart from the fever, was nearly done up. Soon he found himself underneath. He sat on my stomach, pulled out my colt, said Lawrence, pressed it to my temple, and pulled the trigger many times. But the safety catch was on. The Turkoman was a primitive fellow and knew very little about revolver mechanism. He threw the weapon away in disgust and proceeded to pound my head with a rock until I was no longer interested. After taking everything I had, he made off. I went to the village and got the inhabitants to help me chase the scoundrel. We caught him and made him disgorge the things he'd relieved me of. Since then, I've always had a profound respect for a colt, and have never been without one. Chapter 15 My Lord the Camel no knowledge that could increase his influence over the peoples of Arabia was neglected by Lawrence. He even made a minute study of that beast of mystery, the camel, the character and quality of which few Arabs are altogether familiar with, although it plays such an all-important part in their lives. Lawrence is the only European I have ever met who possesses camel instinct, a quality that implies intimate acquaintance with the beast's habits, powers, and innumerable idiosyncrasies. Out of Abu Tayyib, the Bedouin Robin Hood had this instinct developed to an unusually high degree. There are six different species of camels found in Central Arabia, from whence come the finest breeds. The Bedouin call their country the mother of the camel. Arabian camels have but one hump. In fact, most of the Arabs have never even heard of the two-humped variety, which is found only in Central Asia, to the northwest of Persia, chiefly in the Gobi Desert. The two-humped breed is slow and of little use except as a beast of burden. The one-humped camel is the dromedary, which is the Greek word for a camel that runs. The chief unit of wealth in Arabia is the camel. A man is not spoken of as owning so many apartment houses or country estates, but as owning so many camels. From biblical down to modern times, wars have been waged in the desert for the possession of camels. One tribe will swoop down upon another and steal all its camels. Then that tribe will mount its horses, dash across the desert, and drive off all the camels of another tribe. So in the course of twelve months, one camel may have become the stolen property of half a dozen different tribes. The very existence of human life in the desert depends upon the camel. The Arabs use it not only as a beast of burden, they drink its milk, use its hair for making cloth, and when it becomes old they kill it and use its flesh for food. Camel steak in Arabia is regarded much as blubber is among the Eskimos, but the average European would prefer to worry along on caviar and pâté de foie gras. The camel is practically the only animal that can exist on the scant vegetation of the desert. Its teeth are so long that it can chew cactus without the thorns pricking either its lips or the roof of its mouth. Although camels can go for long periods without water, when they do drink, they more than make up for lost time. It takes a half hour to water them, but each camel can accommodate a nice little swallow of twenty gallons. 
It is very irritating when suffering from thirst in the desert to hear your camel drawing on the copious reserve of water inside his body. And at such times the Arabs, when in dire straits, will kill a camel and drink the water in its stomach. The water is of a greenish color and has a greenish taste, but one can't be too fastidious when perishing from thirst. In judging a camel, some of the many things to be considered are the length of the inside of the belly, the way the beast lifts its feet, the way it carries its head, the depth of the neck, the length of the front leg, the length of the front and back shoulders, and the girth and shape of the hump. A very long leg is particularly desirable, as is a small circumference around the waist. A camel should be neither too fat nor too thin. The hump, which should be of hard, fatless muscle, is of paramount importance. The dromedary actually seems to live on its hump, and if it be worked too hard, the hump gradually disappears. If it has no hump, or a low one, or a thin one, or a fat one, the animal is of little value and will break down in a short time. Age is judged by the teeth, as with the horse. Camels usually live for about twenty-five years, being in their prime between the ages of four and fourteen. Over good ground, first-class Arabian dromedaries can trot up to 21 miles an hour, canter up to 28 miles an hour, and gallop up to 32 with their legs going like huge pistons. For whole day's travel, however, the most desirable pace is a jog trot of 7 miles an hour. The ordinary speed for a long journey of many days across the desert is only about 4.5 miles an hour, and if the journey extends over hundreds of miles, it is advisable always to keep the camel at a walk. Lawrence's feat in making a forced trek of 300 miles in three days was therefore looked upon by his followers as almost a miracle. A good camel makes absolutely no sound when it walks, a trait which is of great assistance both to the Bedouins during their night raids and to desert traders who fear assault. The Arab teaches his mount not to whine, and a whole caravan may pass within twenty yards of a tent without being heard by the occupants. The winter of 1917 and 18 was a severe one for the camels. Lawrence's army was at Tafila in January at an altitude of 5,000 feet. The snow drifted to a depth of four feet, impassable for the camels unless the riders dismounted and dug a path with their hands. Many of them, both camels and Arabs, perished from the cold. Lawrence sent a request to headquarters, Cairo, for the heavy clothing and boots for his men. Instead of receiving them, he got a wireless message telling them that Arabia was a tropical country. One morning, an Arab column awoke on a hillside to find that snow had drifted over their crouching camels. They dug them out with the iron spoons which are used for roasting coffee beans, but all were dead. Lawrence and his men had to walk barefoot through the snow for miles before they reached a military encampment. Another time, 34 men started from Aqaba for Tafila on camels, and only one man succeeded in getting through alive. The Arab army had plenty of camels at this time, thanks partly to Prince Zaid. Some months previous, the Turks had sent a large caravan of supplies toward Medina from Hale, Ibn Rashid's capital in Central Arabia. Zaid and his men surprised it at Hanakia, killed 30 Turks, captured 250 more, and also 3,000 camels, 2,000 sheep, 4 mountain guns, and several thousand rifles. Although the camel is an intricate animal and calls for skilled labor in the handling, according to Colonel Lawrence, shields a remarkable return. We had no system of supply. Each man was self-contained and carried on the saddle from the sea base, at which the raid started, six weeks' food for himself. The six weeks' ration for ordinary men was a half bag of flour, forty-five pounds in weight. Luxurious feeders carried some rice also for variety. Each man baked for himself, kneading his own flour into unleavened cakes and warming it in the ashes of a fire. We carried about a pint of drinking water for each, since the camels required to come to water on the average every three days, and there was no advantage in our being richer than our mounds. Some of us never drank between wells, but those were hardy men. Most of us drank a lot at each well, and had a drink during the intermediate dry day. 
In the heat of summer, Arabian camels will do about 250 miles comfortably between drinks, and this represents about three days' vigorous marching. The country is not so dry as it is painted, and this radius was always more than we needed. Wells are seldom more than 100 miles apart. An easy day's march was 50 miles. An emergency march might be up to 110 miles in a day. The six weeks' food gave us a range of over a thousand miles out and home, and that, like the pint of water, was more than ever we needed, even in so large a country as Arabia. It was possible for me, the camel novice in the army, painful was a better word, to ride fifteen hundred miles in a month without revictualling, and there was never a fear of starvation, for each of us was riding on two hundred pounds of potential meat, and when food lacked, we would stop and eat the weakest of our camels. Exhausted camel is poor food, but cheaper killing than a fat one and we had to remember that our future efficiency depended upon the number of good camels at our disposal. They lived on grazing as we marched. We never gave them grain or fodder, and after their six weeks on the road they would be worn thin and have to be sent to pasture for some month's rest, while we called out another tribe in replacement or found fresh riding beasts. The tradition says that the horse originated in Arabia. The most beautiful and symmetrical horses are found there, they do not, however, have the greatest powers of endurance. Neither are they the fleetest. The Arabs are very fond and proud of their horses. They are really domestic animals, and it is by no means uncommon for them to occupy the same tent as their master. The pedigrees of some of them can be traced back to the 5th century, and registered mares are seldom sold, although stallions are sometimes given away to distinguished foreigners. It is maintained that a female, whether horse or camel, has much more highly developed powers of endurance. The Arabs oil the hooves of their horses to keep them from slipping on the hot sand, and feed them on boiled goat's meat to give them staying powers. They are seldom given all the water they desire to drink. Even as colts, they are continually stinted of water so that they may become inured to thirst and suffer as little as possible when crossing the dry parts of the Arabian desert. Many of the water holes of the desert are five, five days' travel apart. A horse, of course, cannot go so long without water. A camel can, however, and so an Arabian horse will travel by the side of a camel and drink the camel's milk, and in that manner make the distance from one water hole to another. The foregoing is but a small fraction of the horse and camel lore familiar to a Bedouin expert. After years of careful study in the Arabian and Syrian deserts, Lawrence confessed to me that often... He could not size up his dromedary correct.